independent? independent? Yes. And then this one is dependent, right? Okay. So remember what independent and independent mean. They mean that the functions are either linear combinations of the other or not. And if they are linear combinations of each other, well then guess what? You'll be able to cancel them out and get zero. <laughs> so that's why when it's linearly dependent, it'll come out to zero. But if they're linearly independent, that means they're so different from each other, it doesn't matter what those little C1s and C2s are, they're never gonna cancel each other out, okay? At least not for every single X. It may cancel each other out for a couple of X values, but not for all the X values, okay? So let's see what we've got here. Now, they gave me a general function. They didn't even give me like a concrete function. It just says, let F1 equal X to the N and let F2 equal X to the N plus one, where N can be anything, okay? So we've got, well, actually, when we start this problem, we're talking about a bunch of different functions here, aren't we? Okay, but we wanna see if they're linearly independent or not. So we have to figure out the Ron scheme. Now I can put F1 and F2 here, but if I'm calculating Ron scheme, what has to go at the bottom? Mm -hmm, the primes, you got it. So then let's go and plug in what we've got. So F1 is this function, F2 is this function, and if I take the derivative of the first function, what does that look like? Remember, you're doing derivatives. So this is the power rule before derivatives. And x to the n minus one. Mm -hmm. Bring down the power and then decrease the power by one, right? That's the power rule for derivatives. Same thing goes here. So you bring down the power and then you decrease it by one, but what happens when I do n plus one minus one? What do I get? Just n. Just n. Okay. And then now in order for me to actually calculate the Ron scheme, I have to do the determinant of this, right? Now before I keep going, if I was given three functions, how many derivatives would I have to take? Right, because I wouldn't have three columns, right? which means I would need three rows in order to do a determinant, right? That's just going back. I don't recall if that's on the test or not, but <laughs> just to keep you guys thinking about the old stuff, right? So for a determinant of a two by two, those are nice because you just cross multiply. So this times this, this is my coefficient, and then you add exponents, right? What is n plus n? Two n minus what I get when I multiply in this direction. So n is my coefficient, and what do I get here when I add n minus one and n plus one? If I take this guy's exponent and I add this guy's exponent, what do you end up with? Just two n. Now, if you already see it, fantastic. If not, distribute this, but something is going to cancel. So I have n x to the 2n minus n x to the 2n. So those two wipe each other out, and I get this. Now, look at the inner rule they gave me. They gave me 0 to infinity. But is zero included? No, it's got a parenthesis, right? If zero was part of my domain, it would have a bracket, okay? And since zero has a parenthesis, that means x cannot be zero. So as long as x is not zero, will this thing ever equal zero if x is not zero and positive, apparently, according to that interval? Will it be? No, it'll never equal zero. So this does not equal zero for all x, okay? Which according to what we talked about earlier, what does that mean? Is it independent or dependent? Mm -hmm. Mm 
Now be careful because this is how you're verifying. You have to do that, otherwise you're just guessing and I don't give people credit for guessing. <laughs> so I know you think, oh, this is a 50-50 shot. If I just write linear and then pick a word, <laughs> I might get it right. You have to actually show me how you determine that, okay? So <laughs> make sure you're doing your wrong scheme, okay? And then make sure you remember this. Even if you have to do a memory dump, right? Just have it on a flashcard real quick. And as soon as I write down the test, you put zero, dependent, not zero, independent, right? And just scribble that down real quick. Okay. So let's go ahead and go on to the good stuff, right? Now we can actually solve <laughs> the DEs. So the rest of the problems, there's seven of them. I tried to pick cleverly, okay? But we've got seven of the different run schemes. Now some of them may be the same kind of cases as the ones on the test. Some of them may not be exactly the same case as the ones on the test, okay? Because remember what we talked about at the beginning, there's like 26 possible problems we could have and I'm not gonna have time to cover all 26. Believe it or not, we have covered almost all of those while we were doing the lectures, okay? So you have documents of all the different possibilities, okay? But we're gonna go and see what we have here. So this one is which kind first? Is it constant coefficients? Or is it Cauchy-Euler? Mm -hmm. Every single one of these coefficients is a constant, right? So that's one thing. Now, is it homogeneous or non-homogeneous? Homogeneous. And those make us happy, right? Because those are faster. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and create our auxiliary equation. So we get m squared minus 6m plus 5 equal to 0. And once I factor this and I find my m's, I go back to my cases and I'm done. So I think it's minus five and minus one. Verify, is that correct? Negative six and positive five, I think so. So then I have m equal to what? Five and one. If I set each of those equal to zero, I'll have to add five to both sides and I'll have to add one to both sides so I get these two answers. So then now, this is which case? We already identified it as a constant coefficient, right? But do I have two distinct real roots, repeated real roots, or conjugate complex roots? Mm -hmm. Distinct meaning different, right? So I do have two different real numbers as my solutions. So this is the case that I want to use. So my answer here is going to be y equals c1 e to the 5x plus c2 e to the 1x, or just x. Now another possible answer could have been this, right? Had I chose to put the 1 in front of the 5. So I'm not counting people wrong for things like that, right? That's the same exact thing. If your answer is equivalent to the one that I got, well, then you're good, okay? It doesn't matter how the little minuscule differences there are, as long as they're equivalent. They may look different, but they're equivalent. So this one's it. This one's nice, because I'm finished. Once you figure that out, you're done, okay? Now, I could have gotten a repeated roots problem, right? Or I could have gotten the complex roots problem. But I promise you there's going to be a constant coefficient homogeneous, okay? That much I can tell you. So <laughs> constant coefficient and homogeneous. Definitely expect one of those, okay? Now which case you get, that just depends on what, what it looks like after you factor it, okay? Let's look over here. First, let's decide which category. Is it constant coefficients or is it the Cauchy-Euler? Again, constant coefficients, right? But this one is what? Homogeneous or non-homogeneous? Non-homogeneous. So again, there's three different cases I could have here, right? I'm not going over all three. We just don't have that amount of time, right? Okay, so let's go see how we do these. I do still need the auxiliary equation. And when you're doing the auxiliary equation, you have to pretend that it's homogeneous. So I will put a zero there, even though it wasn't homogeneous, right? 
Now when I solve this, I actually get one, but it's repeated, isn't it? So that means that my y is going to be the second case, which was c1 e to the one x plus c2 x e to the one x, okay? Now this is not just y, because this, I, my problem was not a homogeneous problem, right? All I've done is actually found the solution to the DE if it were a homogeneous. So this is only what they call the complementary solution. It's not the full solution. It's only like half of it. I still have to get the other half. <laughs> and to do that, I have to actually consider the fact that this guy wasn't homogeneous, right? So we do our Ron schemes. Now, in order to do the Ron schemes, you have to know what Y1 and Y2 are. This part is Y1. This part is Y2. And that's what I use to do my Ron scheme. So here I'm gonna have e to the x and x e to the x. Just like we did in the Ron scheme problem, we have to do the next row, which is derivatives. So what is the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. Now the second one's a little bit more complicated, right? Did I? I gave you your packet? Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody that doesn't have a packet? You don't have a packet. I'm thinking to myself, something's going on here. Erin, do you have a packet? No? Okay. I thought so. That wasn't just crazy. <laughs> okay, go. And three pages. Canvas too, if you like blank ones. If you wanted to just like toss this one, put it under your book, and try it again, right? You could do that. <laughs> okay. This one is a product rule because you got x and then something else with x, right? So we have to do the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, which would just be one, but I don't have to write it if it's just one, right? It's not going to change it. And then just like before, we have to do our determinant. So we're going to get e to the x times both of these terms minus e to the x times x e to the x. I have to distribute that guy. Normally, I don't write this. I actually just distribute, right? When we were doing it in class, I just said, notice you had one term times two terms. Make sure you distribute it, right? Here, I just wrote it out. So I'm going to get x e to the what when I multiply these two? 2x. They have the same base, you add the exponents, right? Then e to the x times this one, I'm just going to get e to the 2x minus, here the x comes in front, but when I multiply these two, what do I get? e to the 2x. So then you notice this term and this term are exactly the same, right? But opposite signs. So they wipe each other out, and I get that w is just e to the 2x, which we need. We're going to need it twice. But let's keep going. Now we need to find w1. So w1 means that the first column, that's what the 1 tells me, okay? The first column is going to get replaced with 0 as if it were homogeneous. And then with f of x, if it's not homogeneous, right? Is this in the correct form that it needs to be in for me to pick out f? Mm hmm it is. Your double prime had to be by itself, right? And it is. So this is my f. And then the second column is going to stay exactly as it was in the line before. So when I do the determinant this time, what is zero times all of those terms? Just zero. And then minus, and I have to multiply these guys. What do you get? Mm-hmm. So it's just negative x cubed 
e to the 2x, right? Okay, now we need w2, right? So this time, what am I doing when I set it up? Right. These guys now go in the second column. And then you're going to take the original first column. So these guys from the original. Okay. So e to the x and e to the x. So do my determinant again. What am I going to get when I multiply these two? Mm -hmm. And then when I multiply those, what am I going to subtract? Zero. So it's just x squared e to the 2x. This is kind of looking nice because once I do my fractions, aren't those e to the 2x is going to go away? So it's not so bad, right? <laughs> it just looks crazy in the meantime. So if I want to find u1, I have to do the integral of w1 over w. So that means I need to take this function and put it over the w function, which means I'm just integrating negative x cubed. And that's not too bad to integrate, x to the fourth over four. You don't need to put the plus c's here, right? They're already going to be taken up by these c's up there. So don't worry about putting the plus c's. Then I'm going to have u2, which is w2 over w. So I have x squared e to the 2x over e to the 2x. And the e to the 2x's go away. I just have x squared. So this ends up becoming x cubed over 3. Again, we do not have to worry about the c's. Then I want to find that other half of the solution, right? The part of the solutions that's particular to this f of x that I have. So that's why we call it yp, because it's particular, not in an initial value particular solution kind of problem, right? That does not the same p. This is just particular to my particular f of x that I have. Had this part been anything other than this exactly, then this whole equation would be different, right? So this is particular to that f of x at the very beginning. And how do we get that? We do u1 times y1 plus u2 times y2. So I take negative x to the fourth over 4 times e to the x plus x cubed over 3 times x e to the x. I can actually simplify that. This is going to become what? Well, can't I multiply the x's together? Right? So I get x to the fourth over 3 e to the x. And those are like terms. So I can do negative 1 fourth plus 1 third. I know I'm going to get 12, but how many? This will be 3, that will be 4, so I have 1 12th. And so that's what I get for yp. So I have the parts, right? I know what the complementary solution is for if it were homogeneous, and I know the particular solution for this specific function that I was given on the right-hand side put them together and you have the actual general solution to the whole thing, right? So c1 e to the x plus c2 x e to the x plus x to the fourth over 12 e to the x. You should make sure that none of these are like terms because if they are, then you don't need to write the second one. You just use the c, the general one, right? But x to the fourth is not like these other guys. So this is the whole solution and it cannot be simplified any further, okay? Now if you do have like terms and you put it over there and you don't notice that they're like that, I might not count off points, but I probably will put what it should be, okay? 
<laughs> we'll just say, hey, these two are the same. You could just put C3 and we got it. Now, I don't know that I have enough space on number five, but <laughs> we'll see if we've got it. I know number three is short, so if I'm giving you a tiny bit of space, it's probably the problem is not very long, okay? So if you're thinking, oh my God, this is one of those, one of these crazy ones, right? <laughs> you're wrong if you've got like this much space to do it, okay? It's not a crazy one. And it shouldn't be. How do I know? Just by looking at number four, how do I know it's not one of these, these? that we just did. Say it again? Aha, uh -huh, it's homogeneous. It's got a zero there, right? So it's not gonna be one of these crazy ones. Now, which set of formulas am I gonna have to look at for my auxiliary equation? Is it constant coefficients or is it a Cauchy-Euler problem? Mm -hmm. Now, just because there's x squared in there or an x doesn't necessarily mean that it's a Cauchy-Euler problem you have to make sure that it fits that definition of a Cauchy-Euler, where the power of x is the same as the number of primes, okay? This power of x is the same as the number of primes, and no primes, no x's, right? As long as it fits that description, then you're good. You can keep going, okay? And the reason why I mention that is because what if I have x squared, x squared, x squared? Couldn't I just divide everybody by an x squared and then it's gonna be a constant coefficient problem. So be careful. So here it's a Cauchy-Euler and it's a homogeneous. So you might see one of those, right? It, it's already in the form that it needs so I don't need to multiply by x's or manipulate it in any kind of way. I'm just gonna go into my auxiliary equation. This one's a little bit harder when you go to the auxiliary equation, right? You don't just say it's, I don't know what, m squared plus m plus one. You can't do that, right? You have to manipulate it. So remember this guy, we'll start from the back. This guy becomes what? What does y become? Mm -mm. It becomes x to the m. Because it becomes x to the m, what is y prime going to be? How do you take the derivative of x to the m? We did it earlier with n. Mm -hmm. And then finally we get to x squared, but we need y double prime, which means we need the derivative of this. m is just a constant multiplier, so it's going to be there. But if I take the derivative of x to the m minus 1, you have to bring down the power and then decrease it by 1 again, right? So you bring down the power and then you decrease it by 1 again, okay? I just memorized that y is going to become x to the m, y prime, m x to the m, and y double prime is going to be m squared minus m times x to the m. I memorized these, okay? If you don't memorize them, they, you can still do the problem. You just have to remember the first one and then derive all the others, okay? Is what I wrote over here from my memory the same as what we got inside this big parentheses? It is, right? If I just... So then what happens is, is you can do that. You can distribute your little m so you get m squared minus m. And then what will become my exponent for this first term for x? Because mm -hmm, you have x squared times x to the m minus 2. You're supposed to add those exponents together, right? So the 2's cancel, and you just get m. Over here, I have m. And then what will be my exponent for x? For the middle term. Same thing, because you have 1 plus m minus 1, the 1's cancel, right? And you just get x to the m. This guy's already x to the m. So then we're going to factor out the x to the m, because that's not the part that I need 
to solve the auxiliary equation, right? The x to the m part doesn't give me any solutions for m. And if you notice, all of these formulas, you need to know what m is, right? This guy, if I set that equal to zero, I can't find out what m is. So this one's not gonna help me. However, the what's in the parentheses will help me solve for m. So those little m's are gonna cancel in the middle. I just end up with m squared plus one equal to zero. You already may know from here what m is gonna be, but if not, minus the one over, and then take the square root, right? What is m in this case? Plus or minus what? I. Now that is not real, it's imaginary, right? So I did identify it as a Cauchy Euler, but I didn't get real answers. I got complex or imaginary, same, same thing. So I have to use this formula when I go to write my solution. And since it was homogeneous, once I do that, I'm done, right? But notice in the formula, it has a bunch of alphas and betas, right? So we need to know what alpha and beta is. Remember that any complex number can be written like this. So you're just looking for those coefficients, okay? So for this, what is my alpha? Zero, because there's nothing in front of the plus or minus, right? And what is my beta? What is a coefficient of i? Mm -hmm. And I don't care about the plus or minus, that's not part of the beta, okay? So then my solution is going to be C1, x to the zero, cosine of one times ln of x, plus C2, x to the zero, sine of one times ln of x. Now you can definitely clean that up. You just get cosine of ln x, plus C2, and sine ln x. Right, x to the zero is just one, so if I multiply c1 times one, I just have c1, and then one times ln of x is just ln of x. So it's all I did was get rid of the little ones that were in there. So I may have needed to put, what's well, because I write huge, but I may have needed to put a little bit more space in between that problem. Okay, what about number five? Is it a constant coefficient or a Cauchy Euler? Mm -hmm. You've got square and a double prime. X to the one and a one prime. No primes, no X's, right? So it's a Cauchy Euler. But this is not zero. So it is a Cauchy Euler, but it is non-homogeneous, right? Let's see what kind this one is. Hopefully it's not one of those, <laughs> but but we'll see. So let's see our auxiliary equation. I'm just gonna use the y, the y primes, and the y double primes for my memory. Okay, I'm not gonna do the deriving of everything. So I have x squared times m squared minus m, m minus two minus 4x times m x to the m minus 1 plus 6 and then x to the m and then we're pretending that it's homogeneous when we find the auxiliary equation right which means we're only finding yc the first half right i'm gonna try not to write so big because i don't think i have i mean i could always get another paper but i know i don't have enough room to do everything we did for number three Maybe, these are nicer than the other ones. Okay, so I get 
m squared minus m times x to the m. Then I get 4m times x to the m, and then 6 times x to the m. If I take the x to the m out, I have m squared minus m minus 4m plus 6 equal to 0. Now I can set that one equal to 0, but it doesn't give me any solutions, and I would have to set this one equal to 0. So m minus 5, m, nope. They both have to be negative, don't they? Yep. I hate the 5-6 combo because people always use the wrong one. <laughs> Make sure you double check that they multiply to give you this sign, right? And when you combine them, you get this sign. Okay, so that means I get m equal to 2 and to 3 which means I'm going to do case one of the auxiliary formulas. Don't get the constant coefficient formulas, right? We need the auxiliary formulas. So that's y equals c1 x to the two plus c2 x to the three. And this is only yc, because this was not a homogeneous. If it were, I'd be done, right? That would be nice. They were all like that, <laughs> but they won't be. <laughs> I have to have at least one of the non-homogeneouses in there. I have to, because I have to make sure you can do that process, right? With the W's and the U's. Okay, so let's see. W will be Y1 and Y2. But these derivatives are a lot nicer. What's the derivative of X squared? Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of x cubed? Mm -hmm. And then when I do my determinant, I get 3x to the 4th minus 2x to the 4th. So w is just going to be 1x to the 4th. Then w1, this is going to be 0 for sure, and the second column is going to be exactly the same. What I'm pausing on is the f of x. Is my function the way it's supposed to be for me to identify what f of x is? No, my y double prime is not by itself, is it? So I'm going to use a little color here to make it stand out. But if I want it to be by itself, I would have to divide everybody by x squared. That's every single term, right? All I need is for the first term here to cancel. I could really care less what's in front of y prime and what's in front of y afterward. All I want to know is here for f of x. So if I divide this term by x squared, what do you end up with? 2x squared. And if I divide this term by x squared, what do you end up with? 1. So that's going to be the f of x that I use, okay? Not just whatever it was equal to, okay? So we have 2x squared plus 1. So now I do my determinant stuff, right? So we multiply this way, we get 0 minus, and then I got to multiply that way. So I actually end up having to distribute a negative x cubed, right? So this becomes negative 2x to the fifth, and then negative 1x cubed. Which is okay, it's still doable. I'm going to divide by x's later, right? That's not going to be anything too crazy. Maybe I will have enough room. <laughs> Let's see. And then this one's going to get replaced by the 0 and the 2x plus 1. So here I multiply those. I don't have any funny business with the negative, so I can just distribute. 2x to the 4th plus x squared. Minus, what do I get when I multiply that way? 0. So we just have 2x to the 4th plus x squared. Now we go to find our u's. long process I know but after you do your homework hopefully you're 
already been conditioned right to it. <laughs> so we get the integral of these guys over this guy. U, W1 over W. And then I'm going to split that and just do each term individually. So that will be negative 2x. This will be negative 1 over x. Right, you have more downstairs than you do upstairs on the first term. Sorry. Okay. So then I can integrate negative 2. And then for this, I'm going to add 1, right? And then divide by the new power. This one's special. You have to use a rule, right? What's the integral of 1 over x? It's ln of x. So you can clean up the 2's, but you still have negative x squared minus ln of x. But still not too bad, right, to integrate? Now let's do u2. So we get 2x to the 4th plus x squared over x to the 4th. When I reduce each of these, I'm going to get 2 plus 1 over x squared. That's different, 1 over x squared. That one I can do the power rule. The only reason I can't do it with this one is because what happens when you add 1 to a negative 1 power? You get 0, right? Then, then you can't divide by 0. <laughs> so you couldn't divide by the new power. That's why that one has its own special rule. But this one I could divide by a negative, right? So here we get 2x, and then we're going to add 1 to the power, which becomes negative 1, and then divide by that new power. So this actually cleans up and turns into 2x minus 1 over x. The negative down here and the positive here become a minus, and then x to the negative 1 just means there's an x downstairs. So now let's get yp. So we're going to have this term times y1, which was x squared, plus these terms times y2, which was x cubed. And then we always simplify this stuff. So if I distribute, I get negative x to the fourth minus x squared ln of x. And if I distribute here, I get... 2x to the fourth minus x squared. These two are like terms. And that's as far as I can go with yp. Okay. So now we just have to put the two parts together. So to give me the full answer, you have to put the complementary solution with the particular solution together. Right? Now this is correct, but it's not simplified. Why? Mm -hmm. You have like terms this time, right? So this guy and this guy, it doesn't really matter what that number is. If I minus one from it, I'm still gonna end up with another constant, right? So instead you can say C3, whatever that number is, times x squared. And then you don't have to write this term anymore. You just write the rest of it. So you're just combining your like terms. So I think all we have left is the, partic the initial value problems. We can't just totally forget about those. We have to do those too.
and I have, of course, one of each. I have one constant coefficient initial value problem, and I have one um, Cauchy-Euler initial value problem. And they are both homogeneous. I didn't make them non-homogeneous because those are the long ones, right? However, because you have eight of them on your review and you only have like five of them on the test, it's not impossible that you might get a non-homogeneous and an initial value problem all in one. I just won't have two separate problems, it'll just be one, right? So that's what I mean. You know, my students always say, well, you didn't have that on the review. Everything is on the review. It's just not, maybe not pieced together exactly the same way, right? <laughs> But it's all there. That's those are the main things. It's constant coefficient, non-homogeneous, homogeneous. Cauchy-Euler, non-homogeneous, homogeneous. And then of course always your initial value problems can be thrown in anywhere in all of those situations. Okay. So let's go ahead and go with number six. Oh, that is number eight. Where is number six? There it is. Oh, we're not at the initial value problems yet. What kind of problem is this? It's exactly the same situation over here, isn't it? I have a Cauchy-Euler non-homogeneous. <coughs> is this a Cauchy-Euler non-homogeneous? So I gave you two of the same one. There must be something funny happening here, so that's probably why I put it on there. <laughs> so let's see what, what, that, what that is. Ah, I know what it is. It's the ugly ones, it's the imaginary ones. Okay, so it does have the square, which matches the double prime, right? And then the X, which matches a single prime, and then no axes and no primes. So it fits that description. So I do have a Cauchy-Euler. And this one is non-homogeneous like the last one. Except I don't want to do something to you with imaginaries on the test and not have gone over imaginary situations on the review, okay? So if I were to set up the auxiliary equation, this is the long one, but still got to do this. I can factor out the x to the m because I already know that these two guys are going to make x to the m and these two guys are going to make x to the m. Right? I'm just cutting out my lines so I can have more paper later. I'm going to end up with m squared minus m minus m plus 1 because I took out all the x to the m's. Right? So then I get x to the m and m squared minus 2m plus 1. Well, this one's not going to be an imaginary. Oh, but this is going to be repeated. That's why. So this part of the equation is not going to give me any solutions. But this part of the equation will. And I can factor that. But I don't get the same kind of case as I got in the last problem. Right? The last one we had two distinct answers, didn't we? This time, we get a repeated one. So it is one, but twice, right? Which means my YC is going to be C1 X to the one, or just X, plus C2 X to the one again, but times an LN of X. So that's why it gets more weird because then my Ron schemes are going to include these ln of x's and everything's going to have ln of x's, right? Unless they go away. But we'll see. So my Ron schemes going to be x and x ln of x. Derivative of x is 1. This is a product. So the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Well, that just means I'm going to get 1 plus ln of x. So I'm not looking at this, even though that's how I figured it out, right? I'm just going to be using this when I do the determinants. So this way, we get x plus x ln of x. And then we minus 
an x, ln of x. So we got lucky. Those went away, didn't they? That was going to be ugly to have to divide by some ln of x's. <laughs> okay, so luckily they all went away. We're only dividing by x later. Now I'm going to write what I know is going to stay, but the f of x. Is my function in the correct form for me to figure out what f of x is? No, it's supposed to be in this form, right? y prime by itself, something with x next to y, y double prime by itself, something with x times y prime, something with x maybe times y, and then I can see what my f of x is, right? So how do I get the y double prime by itself? Mm -hmm. And then you just have to make sure you do it everywhere, right? So when I do that, what is the f of x going to become? What is x cubed divided by x? Just x. So that's what I'm going to use here, is just x. And then we do our determinants. So 0 times both of those two terms it's just two zeros or a single zero and then minus an x squared ln of x so I just get negative x squared ln of x for w2 we have x and 1 0 and x cross multiply cross multiply we just get x squared that one's nicer the other one's not So u1 is going to be negative x squared ln of x divided by x, which means negative x ln of x. Mm. Now when you're doing this, you can do you have to do by parts. You can't really do the tabular method by parts because you can't integrate ln of x easily. You could use the book. It has this crazy formula, right? But it's not a nice one like a power rule or anything. So that's not the one that if you were to do the tabular method, it wouldn't be the v part where you integrate. It would have to be the u part because you can take a derivative of it. The problem is, is the first time I take a derivative, I get 1 over x, don't I? And when I take the derivative again, I'm going to get negative 1 over x squared. And when I take it again, it doesn't ever diminish. It doesn't ever get to 0, ever. Okay? So that tabular method is not going to help me. Okay? So I'm going to have to do this by parts, but I'm going to have to do it with the rule by parts. Okay? So I'm going to say let u equal the ln x, because the derivative is pretty. And then dv is going to be the x. I could put the negative x, it doesn't matter. So when I take the derivative of ln of x, I get 1 over x. When I do the integral of negative x, I get negative x squared over 2. Now according to the biparts formula, my answer should be uv minus the integral of v du. So that's what I'm going to write next to my equal sign, but with all the people where they belong, right? Let me give myself some more room. So u is ln of x, v is negative x, minus the integral of v again, negative x, and then du. I forgot the dx here, but you need it in order to integrate, don't you? Okay. So let's clean that up a little bit. So I brought the negative x to the front of the ln, and then I have a negative and a negative, don't I? So those are just going to become a positive, and what happens to the x's? They cancel, and I just get 1. And what do you get when you integrate just 1? Mm -hmm. And if you wanted, you could write it the other way so that your negative is in the back and not in the front. But those are the same. Okay. Yep. 
If I didn't have ln of x, if I had e to the x, I would have probably done the tabular method because the derivative of x is 1, derivative of 1 is 0, right? And then it diminishes, and I would have been able to use the tabular method. It's just here you couldn't because, yes, x, 1, 0, but what happens when you try to start integrating that? It's too hard, right? So that's why we couldn't do this method with that problem. Okay, that's u1. u2 is a whole lot easier. <laughs> x squared over x. Nice. We just get, yes, go ahead. Uh-huh. So v, oh, thank you, you caught it. So it shouldn't have been this guy, right? Yep, v is this guy. Good catch, good catch. I saw you looking at it kind of funny. Let's keep this there. So V should have been this person, right? So negative X squared over two, and then DU is still this guy. But that means that this isn't gonna just be one then, is it, right? You still have negative and a negative, which gives you positive. But when the X cancels, you end up with X over 2 still, right? And you can still integrate that. It'll be x squared over 2, but if there's already a 2 down there, what do you end up getting at the bottom? 4. And so then if I want to rearrange it, I could. I just have to make sure I have that right term, right? <laughs> the correct term. Good catch. Okay, this one does reduce there, so we just get x squared over 2, and that's it for that one. We don't really have anything else to do with that one. So then yp is going to be these guys times y1 plus this guy times y2. And if I distribute and clean that up, I'm going to end up getting x cubed over 4 minus x squared ln of x plus x cubed over 2 ln of x. Are any of those like terms? You've got two terms with ln of x, but are the x's exponents the same? No, so those are not like terms, okay? So let's try to put it together with our first part. So we get c1x plus c2x ln of x, and then plus these three terms. And none of these are like terms. This has an x in front of the ln of x, this has an x squared in front of the ln of x, and this has an x cubed in front of the ln of x. So you can't combine any of them. Oops, yeah, I'm done. I was like, is this an initial value? Do I have to keep going? But no, we're good. Okay, that's the last long one I have to do. <laughs> All the rest of the last two are homogeneous, so they're not going to take us this long to do. You will have one, at least one, maybe two. It just depends. I like to be able to do the, the whole test in about 10 to 15 minutes. Then I'm pretty sure y'all can do it in the amount of time you need to do it. So that's usually what I shoot for. So whatever I can do, and I don't rush through it. I actually like... 10, 15 minutes. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. That's how long it takes me to... The last one, I think it took me seven minutes to do. 
The Last of Us. But that's I'm just practicing. me. I must not be practicing. <laughs> but I know it. You know what I mean? Yeah, y'all are learning it, which is why I have to. I have to multiply. The department says I'm only supposed to multiply by three, which means if y'all have two hours, that would take me what, like, I don't even know, 40 minutes to take an exam. If it takes me 40 minutes to take it, that is way too much, just in my opinion. <laughs> so I tried to do it. I tried to first. I tried to do it by five. So then 120 divided by five, or yeah, is what? It's 120 divided by five. 50, I don't even know, can't do simple math. How much is it? 120 divided by five is two, 20, yeah, 25. Something like that, almost 25, it's like 22 point something or another, okay? But again, even 22 minutes to me is a long time. So I try to cut it a little bit, especially for this class. Calculus classes, yeah about 20 minutes if I could do it in 20 minutes they should be able to do it in two hours but I don't have two hour classes in calculus so if I can do it in 10 minutes they should be able to do it in an hour okay so that's usually just the rule I stick with I think the last one we had it pretty good I think a couple people took about 30 or 40 minutes to do it and then some people took like an hour and a few people took a little bit more than that but you did okay as far as timing <laughs> This test, though, is, I think, is easier. And based off of the results from last semester and based off of my colleagues' results from teaching this previously, they all say that, and even my results showed, that people do better on this second test than they do on the first one. One, because it's just everything's completely new and you're having to do all these different methods, where this is just auxiliary equations and then you either have to do the non-homogeneous junk or not. Okay, so it's not like a whole bunch of different methods all in one. Okay, okay, let's keep going. Number seven. So, is this one a constant coefficient or a Cauchy Euler? Constant, there's no x's here at all, right? So, that's a dead giveaway. It's a constant, okay, which means I'm going to be using my top equations once I figure out m. It also means that when I do the auxiliary equation, it's a lot easier, right? So when I do my auxiliary equation, it's just going to be m squared plus 2m plus 2. And then, oh no, I can't factor that. The only factors of 2 are 2 and 1. But those will never add to give me 2. So that means I have to do my quadratic formula, which means either my answers are going to look really weird with square roots or they're going to be imaginary. Okay, one of the two things. So let's see what we get. M is going to be negative, negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC over 2A. That's what I'm doing here. So negative 2 plus or minus 2 squared is 4 minus 4 times 1 times 2, which is 8, over 2 times 1, which is just 2. So I end up with negative 4 under there, which is nice, because that's just 2i. And if I divide both of these by 2, I get negative 1 plus or minus i. So this is the complex. But if you look at the complex equations on your sheet, your note sheet, they have a bunch of alphas and betas again, don't they? Okay, so what is alpha here? And what is beta? One. So then now I can go into my equation and say C1 e to the alpha x cosine of beta times x plus c2 e to the alpha times x and then sine of the beta times x. Now I'm going to clean it up. Okay. Now 
if this was not an initial value problem, I'd be done, right? But it does have the initial conditions. So it has something for y, but then it also has something for y prime, doesn't it? So that means I have to figure out what y prime is going to look like before I can plug in the numbers and figure out what the system is, okay? So let's, oh gosh, this is ugly. But at least we have it on the, <laughs> on the review, so you have some kind of example of the ugliness. So that's just a constant multiplier. But these are two different functions with x's in them. So I have to do the product rule here. So the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. That's what I get for the first term. Ugh. Plus C2, we get the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. That's the second term. I definitely want to clean this up before I keep going. So I'm going to get negative C1 e to the negative x sine x and then negative c1 e to the negative x cosine x here I'm gonna get positive c2 and there I'm gonna get negative c2 Now you are supposed to be solving for C1 and C2, so you don't want to be combining like terms and putting C3s in there, right? It's not going to help the cause. Now some of this stuff, probably half of it's going to go to zero because when you plug in pi, that's on the x-axis, right? So some of these things are going to go to zero. So when I plug in for the first condition, that goes into y. I'm going to use the simplified version of y, okay? So I have 1 equals c1 e to the negative pi. And what is cosine of pi? I'm going to draw a unit circle. Here's pi. What is the x value of that point of my location? Negative 1. Then I have C2, e to the negative pi, and what is the y value of this position? Zero. So there I can already see some of that's going to go away, isn't it? Okay. That should already help me figure out what C1 is, but let's go look at the second equation before we go solving the system. So now I gotta go to y prime. Now I'm gonna use this condition. So the y prime is gonna become two, and then I'm plugging in what this time? Am I still plugging in pi? No, pi over two, which is up here, okay? So when I start figuring out my cosines and sines, I need to be looking at this position. Okay, so I have negative C1 e to the negative pi over 2, and sine, what is the y value up here? The y is 1, because it's a unit circle, right? So the radiuses are all 1. Good. C1 e to the negative pi over 2, and the cosine, what is the x value here? We're dead center, right? So zero. C2, e to the negative x. Again, another cosine, another zero. Oh, I put x, but I should have put pi over two. And then sine is another positive one. So these two terms will go away, but I will end up with two equal to negative C1, e to the negative pi over two and negative c2e to the negative pi over 2. 
So that's the system I have to solve for. Now luckily I don't need to do the elimination method because that would have been really weird with one of e the equations having e to the pi, right? And the other equations having e to the negative pi over 2. So that would have been really complicated to try to do elimination method here. So we are definitely lucky in that we can already figure out what C1 is and then just plug it in. Okay. So let's go to this equation. And I'm going to divide by negative e to the negative pi on both sides so that I can get C1 all by itself. Now when I do that, doesn't a negative power just bring me upstairs, right? So it's e to the positive pi, and what's a positive one divided by a negative one? The sign will be what? It'll be a negative. So I get that c1 is e to the negative, or just e to the pi negative e to the pi. So now I'm going to take that and plug it into the second. Lots of algebra, right, in this one. So I know that that's going to give me a positive. And what do I get from my exponent when I add those exponents together? What is pi minus half a pi? How much pi should I have left? If I eat half of it. <laughs> I should still have half, right? <laughs> so pi over 2 is still there. Now this one's going to look really weird. But I have to minus this term over. And then I have to do the same thing kind of like I did over there. I have to divide by the negative e to the negative pi over 2. So that I get c2 all by itself. Here though you have two different terms. Okay, When you do the 2, it's going to become negative 2e to the positive pi over 2 because I'm bringing the bottom guy up to take care of that negative exponent. For the second one, a negative divided by a negative is a positive. And when you bring this upstairs, it's going to be positive as well, isn't it? So I'm taking a pi over 2 plus another pi over 2, which is a full pi now. So just keep in mind, all I did was do this. I'm going to erase it. I split it right into two separate fractions and then brought the e to the negative pi upstairs so that it became that one was easy and this one became e to the pi over 2 and then that one went up there and became e to the pi over 2 positive and because those are multiplied I just added their exponents and that's where I got this guy from okay so that's all I needed to do was find C1 and C2. And as ugly as C2 is, that is what it is, okay? So I can give them my actual solution. My solution is supposed to be C1, negative e to the pi, plus C2, which is this weird thing, sign x. Now you could, this is the answer, you could do all kinds of variations. You could put the e's together, right, and just put one exponent. You could distribute that e to the negative x sign x. I mean, there's a bunch of things you could do here, but I wouldn't even bother. That was already enough, right? <laughs> this one's really weird. I don't think I do that on the test. I'm going to have to go take it again just to make sure. <laughs> but this one really made us go back made us go back to our unit circle, made us go back to all of our exponent rules. I mean, really, really exercising all those skills.
which is better to do here on the review, right? So that you're okay, somewhat okay <laughs> on the test. Okay, we have one more problem. Looks like we will probably finish. I can't see, there's like a glare, but we should be finishing before the end of class. So if anybody has questions or wants to work on homework or has questions on homework, we'll have some time for that, okay? That was just my side work. Okay, number eight is, see, I knew that was going to happen. This one's not a homogeneous, is it? Is it a um, constant coefficient or is it a Cauchy Euler? <coughs> mm -hmm. The primes match the exponents of x, don't they? This one doesn't have any primes. So it doesn't have any x's, right? Okay, it's missing the y prime, but that's really not necessary. You don't have to have a y prime in there, okay? You can still do the problem the same way. So my auxiliary equation, just from memory, right, is going to be the m2 minus m, and then the x to the m minus two, and then y by itself is just x to the m. And we're supposed to pretend it's homogeneous for now. Oh, this is going to have ln of x's in it. I can already see it. Okay. So these two guys are going to make an x to the m, which means I can factor out an x to the m, and I'm going to get m squared minus m minus 2. I don't have to worry about setting that guy equal to 0. I just have to worry about this one. And hopefully, I think that works. Multiply, they give me negative 2. Combine, they give me negative 1. Okay, good. So we get 2 and negative 1. Now, this is the Cauchy Euler, right? So we got to use those formulas. So that means that yc equals c1x squared plus c2x to the negative 1 according to the formula for the different real roots. Bring these formula paper with you. If you happen to have scribbled all over yours or you forgot it, I'll have more, but you can use that and bring your own. I'll have extra. <coughs> Okay, so I have my y1 and my y2 to start the nightmare, right? So we have x squared, x to the negative 1. Derivatives would be 2x, and that's it. Here would be... Mm-hmm. You bring down the power, but when you decrease a negative, it becomes bigger in a negative sign, right? Just a bigger negative. But I think what happens here when I distribute or when I do determine it is what's two plus negative two? Mm -hmm. And the same thing, one plus a negative one. 
So really, this is just a negative 1 minus 2, which is what? Yep. And that's nice, because when I'm doing my integrals, I can just factor that out, right? It's not even part of the problem. Okay. I mean, it'll be there, but it's not part of my problem having to in integrate. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, we have that problem again. Can't pick out my f of x yet y double prime is not by itself. So if I divide everybody by x squared, what am I going to get for f of x? What is x over x squared? 1 over x. So that means here I'm going to have 0 and 1 over x. Maybe I won't have LNs. Maybe, maybe, maybe I was wrong. Hopefully I was wrong. <laughs> what is zero times negative x to the negative two? Zero. Minus, this guy can be written as x to the negative one, right? The green one, one over x. So I'm gonna multiply these guys because I like the power versions better, right? So when you add negative 1 plus negative 1, what do you get? Negative 2. So this is just a negative x to the negative 2. Then w2. So this um, column stays the same. This one will become that. And I just use the exponent version right, of 1 over x instead. Instead of the fraction, I use the x to the negative 1. I'm going to do the same thing again, determine it. What is 2 plus negative 1? <coughs> mm -hmm, it's just x to the 1, or just x, minus 0. So I just get x. Well, this is not bad then. This is not bad. I thought I was going to have ln ins, but it didn't. <laughs> I saw 1 over x in my head and I was like, oh no, there's LNs, but there wasn't. So that's good. So we get negative x to the negative 2 over negative 3, which means I get 1 third positive x to the negative 2. If I add 1 to the exponent, I just have to divide by the new exponent, which means we get negative 1 third x to the negative 1. Then for u2, we're going to have x over negative 3, which is a negative 1 third that comes out. And then the integral of x is x squared over 2, so I get negative 1 over 6 x squared. Almost, almost. I just gotta keep putting the pieces together, right? So y is gonna be u1 times y1. So this guy times the x squared up there plus u2 times y2. So I get negative one third x, negative one plus two is just gonna be an x to the one. Here the signs are gonna be negative in the end, and then one six and I have the same thing happening. A two plus a negative one is gonna give me a one exponent. So I can actually combine those this is negative 2 over 6, so I get negative 3 over 6, which is actually a negative half. If you have a calculator, you can type in negative 1 third minus 1 six, right? It'll pop out negative 1 half. And that's not y, that's just yp, sorry. 
why is the C and the P together, right? So I get C1x squared plus C2x to the negative 1 plus what I got here. So it's actually minus 1 half x. Now that's great. But am I done? Mm -mm. I have to keep going. It's probably why this one came out so nice. <laughs> because I, was, I wasn't done when I was finished. When I thought I was finished. So this is an initial condition, which means I do have to go figure out what C1 and C2 should be. Like, is it a five, is it a four, is it a negative one? What is it supposed to be, okay? Nice thing is, is with the Cauchy-Euler problems, taking the derivatives is not so bad. Not like the other one where we had to do product rule and stuff like that, right? So when I have to do the derivatives here, it's not as complicated. So Y prime is going to be 2C1X minus C2X to the negative 2 minus 1 half. That's just using the power rule for derivatives to take that derivative. So you bring down the power and decrease the power by 1. You bring down the power, decrease the power by 1. Here, the power is 1, so it doesn't change the 1 half. And if I decrease 1 by 1, I get 0, right? So there's no more x's on that last term. Okay, let's set up our system. So for y, back up here, I'm going to plug in 1 for x, and I'm going to get 2 for y. So this is going to become 2, and I'm going to plug in 1 for x. So I get C1 plus C2 minus a half. Now the other condition, you have it on your paper, but the other condition is Y prime of one equals zero. So the Y prime will become zero and I'm gonna again be plugging in a bunch of ones. So I get zero and I get two C1 minus C2 minus one half. Now here I've got these fractions, right? But we could still use the elimination method. And I don't even have to manipulate it at all, right? To do the elimination method. Because I see I have a positive C2 and a negative C2 right now, right? So these two guys will eliminate immediately. So 2 plus 0 is 2, 1 and 2, that's 3C1. These guys together will just make a negative 1. And then I can solve for C1. So add 1 over, divide by 3, and I get that C1 is just 1. And then I can plug that in into either equation. So I could plug it into the top one or the bottom one, doesn't matter. I'm going to plug it into the top one just so that I don't have to multiply by 2. So I'm going to say 2 equals 1 plus C2 minus 1 half. 2 equals C2 plus a half if I combine these two guys. And then if I minus that over, that's 2 minus a half, which means I have 1 and a half left, right? Which is the same as <coughs> 3 over 2. Again, you can use your calculator, it'll tell you 3 over 2. So then my answer should be C1 is 1, so just x squared. C2 is 3 over 2. And this is the final, final answer. So I plugged in my C1 and I plugged in my C2 and everything else stayed exactly the same. Oh, I messed up. I put a C, didn't I? <laughs> it's supposed to be C2 times X to the negative 1. There we go.